Good morning. Um, what a great set of uh, uh, speakers this morning. I learned a lot, and um, what a what an awesome set of new tools that are coming up. I'm excited about that. And um, I'm going to show you some of the tools that we're using that um, Esri um, uh, has out right now, but I'm excited about trying to incorporate some of those newer tools in as well. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm talking about using GIS and GIS tools specifically with a large-scale regional monitoring program that we've been doing for a long time. This project started back in 1994. We basically do a comprehensive survey of the coast every five years. Um, and I've, I've been involved with it since 1994. There are tons of agencies that have ha do participate and have participated, and those agencies all do something for us as far as um, going out, taking samples, collecting data, submitting data to us. It's a very, very large undertaking. And essentially what the goal of all of this is, is to see what the conditions are out in the ocean um, on a regional basis. Um, more, most recently, in the last few surveys, we've moved to, um, into um, the bay areas and the estuaries and um, also into rivers and streams. So it's, it's a very comprehensive project um, with lots of uh, participants. There have been challenges in the past, and a lot of you are probably familiar with these challenges. Um, one of the things that we used to do is release a Microsoft Access um, data entry tool. Um, that folks would put on their computers. And I tell you, it was a challenge every time because um, they would have different versions of Office, different versions of Access. To, um, they wouldn't have the drivers that were needed in order to run it. It was a big problem. Um, and and uh, that has gone away now. Um, we've also had um, things where um, user levels um, a lot of these folks are scientists. They don't necessarily know how to use the technical um, tools that allow you to enter data um, and uh, do data analysis and those kinds of things. Um, and then another important thing is that there's been no real-time information as far as um, what's going on with the survey, which samples have been collected, which ones still need to be collected. Um, and one of the biggest um, challenges we have um, as far as an uh, information management group is that we need to make the data available to the folks that are going to be doing the analyses um, in a very timely manner. So some of the goals for this project, um, as, I, as I just mentioned, um, uh, we need to be able to get that data to people. We need to keep the project managers informed. We, we need to have our hand on the pulse of what's going on as the survey is, is, um, go, um, is, is going on. And we also need to make sure that the data that is submitted to us by all these different users and people are of uh, the highest quality possible. Essentially, we've got all these different things we need to think about, but when it boils down to um, um, what we really need to do, it basically comes down to acquisition. How are we going to get that data into our system? Um, how are we going to manage it once it comes in? And then how are we going to get it out to folks so that they can do their analyses and um, create their reports? Now, the BITE project is pretty complex. There are a lot of people play that are players in this, and this gives a better representation of actually what happens, and, and there's a lot of steps here. These steps go from planning to data availability at the very end, and they all invi involve GIS at some level. Um, and I will be going over each one of these and, and, and kind of explaining what happens, and. Um, explaining what we're going to be doing for the next project that's coming up in 2018. So the first thing that happens is planning. We bring everybody together, all the agencies, all the, all the um, interested parties together, and we start planning. We want to know what's, what, what questions do we want to um, answer. Um, we form subcommittees. Each subcommittee has a task and a question that they're responsible for. And then this is the first point at which we really start using our GIS tools. We use a stratified random design, which is um, a very complex type of design that allows us to um, give each sample point an area weight so that we can make, um, um, we can extrapolate our data to larger areas. So one of the first things that we do is we sit down with folks and we look to see what kind of strata we want to use. In this case, we've got a lower slope, which is, to, uh, 
Um, I think uh, 500 to 1,000 meters. We've got um, inner shelf, which is 30 to 100 meters, or um, 5 to 30 meters. Um, we just have all kinds of different strata that we look at. And we use ArcGIS to do, um, do the, the analysis to determine the sample sites. And what was really great was hearing how our integration is, gonna take, is taking place with the ArcGIS tool, because we also use packages in R to do our sample draws. And basically what comes out of this is, once we um, do all our analysis, is we get a set of sample um, sites that's pretty representative of um, the areas within the bite. So these are just a subset of the sample sites that we look at. Um, people who are going out and looking um, at the benthic um, um, community, um, the trawl communities with the fish and invertebrates. Um, and this is a representative um, so, um, uh, set of samples from uh, BITE uh, 2013 that we had. So that's our first use of uh, GIS in um, all of this. The subcommittees then get together, and we have a lot of subcommittees. I've listed them all there on the left side, um, and, and we have a lot of meetings where I work all the time. Um, and there's some folks in the audience here who go to those meetings. Um, but we also have what I call special studies, and the special studies are what keeps us on our toes, because those could be anything. If somebody comes to us and says, we have an interest in looking at a, a particular um, uh, condition, um, we will do the special studies. And that makes it difficult when we're trying to put together the requirements for data submission and data display and, and those kinds of things. So we have our subcommittees that come together. They do all kinds of different things. They most importantly agree on uh, reporting requirements. What data are we going to submit? What's the form? What are the formats? Those kinds of things. Um, and then we send our field crews out. Now, based on those sample draws that were done earlier, um, they're going to go to a specific set of sites. They're going to collect samples. They're going to send those samples off to the labs to be analyzed. And while that's going on, it's very important that our program managers know what's happening. So um, one of the things that we are planning on doing is using some of the ESRI tools um, to inform those managers of what's going on. Those sub subcommittee uh, folks also need to know what's going on. And um, um, first, let me talk a little bit about data entry. Data entry for us has been um, a difficult thing. As I mentioned earlier, the skill levels of some of the users are, are all over the place. And we've used those Microsoft Access data entry templates. We uh, used a tablet um, program for the last um, go-round in 2013. Those all took development time. Now um, we've got some products such as Survey123 and Collector from Esri, which we can use to collect our data. We've got field data where they're out in the, the field um, collecting uh, um, samples, they collect information on conditions at each station and that they can, very, they can very easily enter those into here. One of the things we want to stress at all times is the quality of the data. And this is Survey123. What it allows us to do is to set up some uh, criteria uh, for the types of data that we are collecting. What's great, too, is we don't have to worry about what kind of hardware they have. Uh, most folks have computers. They can, they can fill this information on computers. It doesn't matter what type of computer, necessarily. Most folks have some tablets they now take out into the, um, into the um, environment to do some sampling. And um, they can also use their phones if required. So it makes it very flexible for us. Um, the other thing with using the tablets and phones is um, we've had people in the past lose things overboard. And with the tablets and, form, uh, and phones, um, particularly with some of the tablets, they're cheap enough now that they're very easy to replace, instead of buying those expensive, ruggedized computers. The other great thing, this is another thing that um, Esri allows us to do, is to put together a custom web page where people can go and find everything in one location. So this is an example of a, a plant field collection um, uh, project we, um, we had uh, demoed. And basically, folks can come here. They can um, manage their data. They can visualize their data, do a whole bunch of things. And this is great for what we need um, as far as 
the managers and the committee people being able to come here and find information on, on what's going on. So, somebody showed a very similar um, graphic yesterday. They were doing some, um, some diving sampling, I believe, um, and basically, this is the operations dashboard. Um, what we're gonna use this for is keeping our managers informed as far as sampling success. You can see we've had one, we had one um, unsuccessful sample right there. The rest are um, successful. And um, this is imp very important in keeping um, um, everybody informed and letting them know what's going on. One of the things we've had trouble with in the past, and I'll tell you, in 1994, an, an interesting story, when people would go out into the field, they would come back and they would fax their success into the office. Now, with this, we can automatically have some real-time data, we can know what's going on, and we don't have to worry about um, receiving information after the fact from, from the sampling crews. So this is gonna be very critical to um, our program manager overall. The other thing that we have, particularly for the subcommittee um, folks, is that they have now the ability to do some data screening. Um, and they're looking for all of these things over here. What they can do is they can actually go into something like this and they can make changes to their data. But the great thing about this particular tool is we can turn on a function that tells us who made the changes. So before what we used to do, is folks had to send us an email or they had to fill out a form and they would send it to us and we would make the changes. But now we can let the subcommittees make changes to their own data and we have a record of those changes as they've been made. They can also look at some basic um, uh, analyses um, as the data is coming in rather than waiting to get the whole da data set at the very end. So some very powerful, powerful tools. Um, next, the analysis and reporting. This is a very lengthy process for each of the subcommittees. Um, and I can't tell you the number of times, you know, the subcommittees change every five years. Mem members of those subcommittees change every five years. And every five years, they end up doing the same analysis, but a different person does it, and they do it a different way, and they have to write the program all over again. So, um, we, we're, we're very excited um, about some of the tools that are now out there that are allowing us to have the same analysis done each time on the fly instead of um, having people have to sit at their desk and, and do it themselves. Um, and again, everything must be timely. One of the, the biggest um, uh, things that happens every five years is that we want to get quicker. We want to have those reports come out quicker. We want the analysis to be done quicker. And um, as I said, a lot of these tools let us do the, that. This is an, ex is an example of an analytical dashboard um, uh, that we've created uh, for a particular project. And basically, it gives some information uh, to folks to let them know um, where some of the values are at. Um, in this case, um, we've got a value that um, is, um, um, uh, looks at a range of values for that particular parameter, in this case it's arsenic, and says this falls within a range of all the values that we've ever received. Um, this gives uh, the ability to put a threshold and see if, that, um, see if the average is above the threshold. So there's a lot of powerful tools that can be used um, using this dashboard, and we'll provide our, our, um, our folks with some useful information. I recently presented um, story maps um, to um, some staff uh, where I work, and they became extremely excited. Um, and mostly because every year, every year that we do um, the bite project, those um, folks go out and they report, a, they, they make a report about that thick. No lie, they, they, they go and, and, and they go at it. Um, but this allows them to make something online and not have to make that thick document. Um, and what we're particularly excited about is the interaction that you can have with things in um, story maps. So I took an example of our sediment toxicity report from Byte 13, I put it in here. It gives us the ability and it also makes us better at making things very concise and to the point put in some results, um, and then from there you can actually go and 
interact with a map, um, you can see graphs. Um, and, and folks were just extremely excited um, in our place about this. Not only that, but you have the ability to put some links in, and if you click on a link, it'll take you to a specific area. There's, there's some other things that you can do with this stuff, like having pop-up boxes and stuff that just make it very interactive and, and, and very easy to use. So we're real happy with this. And, and when we're looking forward to getting all our reports into story maps. One of the pain points for us at the very end of these projects is making data available in a, in a timely manner um, to the public. Because all of this data is collected, it needs to be um, turned over to the public. Typically what we've done is we've put them in CSV files, put some metadata attached to it, and um, put it out on our website. And wouldn't you know we get requests for data all the time saying, we want data just for this specific area. And rather than um, make a tool that uh, um, does that kind of stuff, um, we've kind of um, put it off long enough that Esri's come along and, and made a, the tool for us. So it's been uh, a really good thing. Um, we have the open data um, ArcGIS portal. Um, it's a really nice place to put our data. Um, we can control um, when people see the data. We can make it public or just keep it um, internal to our organization or to anybody we want to share it with. So one of those rules that happens um, during the BITE projects is the data can't be shared until the report, reports are produced. And this allows us to do that. Once it's in, um, it's, it's in pub, um, it can be publicly available, it uh, is put up here and anybody can access it. Not only can they access it, but they can access um, anything related to it. They can also access uh, metadata um, associated with it. They can map it. They can do whatever they want with it. And it makes, just makes it really easy for us. The other thing that um, folks can do um, is they can add in other layers um, and map um, other layers on top of it. So it, makes, it, it just makes it a, a much more fluid um, and, and transparent uh, way of uh, managing our data. So we're really excited about all these tools, and um, we're looking forward to incorporating some of the newer tools that uh, were introduced for sure this morning and anything else that might come out. And one of the things that we've um, come to believe and, uh, and really uh, take to heart is typically when we've done these projects, we've done it from the bottom up. Now we want to do it from the top down. We really want to focus on what the scientists need needs are, what, um, what kind of analysis they're going to do, and then we'll decide kind of how to manage and how to acquire the data based on that and involve more, them more in the process. So I like to end with this because this is kind of how we see the IT um, realm or how it works for us in a lot of cases. Oftentimes the customer can't necessarily explain exactly how they want things, um, and so you get a whole bunch of different things. Um, but in the end, this is actually what they want, and this is where we want to start this time and work back from there. So thank you.